Hi everybody, this is week 14 of History 310. Hope everything is going well for you. And there's a lot to talk about this week. A uh, lot of things that are covered in chapters 32 and 33. So let's go ahead and jump into it. Um, the kinds of things that are happening in California in the years following World War II are probably best manifested in cultural trends. Uh, one example of that is in the literature of the time. If you've read any of the books by Joan Didion, she talks about how California has sort of deteriorated from what might be called the halcyon days of the Second World War, at least in terms of the economics. Um, there's also a lot to look at in terms of the experiences of ethnic minorities. Some of those uh, works are cited in the bibliography, so if you have an extra, uh, some extra time you want to find out more about it, take a look at one of those books, and, um, <coughs> pardon me, uh, might be a good uh, learning experience for you. Um, as far as music goes, one of the things that I want you to think about in both the text and in any music you may be listening to from the time, the changes in popular music were reflective in some ways of the situa situation that was going on in California. Um, the complexity of political issues, the development of the counterculture, um, American society, society struggling through the 1960s is really encapsulated in a lot of the music there. The text talks about how the music was a, quote, galvanizing force for the youth movement that was centered in California. So I'd like you to think about that. Then in the first part of chapter 33, they talk about, among other people, Ronald Reagan uh, and his time as governor of California. Of course, his background before that also. So I'd like you to think about how there's a continuity between his time in Sacramento and his presidential terms, because the philosophies are very similar. Uh, tax reductions, cuts in welfare, cuts in education spending. Uh, although those ideas are not new to California, Reagan really encapsulated them uh, in a, a different way. Um, very skilled politician. Even if you don't agree with his policies, there's no doubt that he rose from what was essentially a debacle of the Republican Party in 1964 to win the governorship in 1966. Uh, and he was also able to tap into uh, the desire for change that Americans felt in 1980 at the end of the Carter years. Um, he was very good at using the media, radio and television. Um, again, you don't have to agree with his uh, policies to understand that he was a very good communicator. In fact, that was his nickname uh, when I was growing up. The book also talks about maybe the most consequential political measure of your lifetimes in California, and that's Proposition 13. The idea that property taxes are going to be cut uh, at the expense of public services, uh, schools, and other things within California. Uh, because many of those uh, services rely primarily on local property taxes. Um, it was an anti-government movement at a time when it wasn't necessarily popular to be anti-government. Uh, so it was not even fashionable in 1978, but somehow Howard Jarvis and Paul Gann uh, made it uh, more fashionable. Could a measure like that pass today? I don't know, but it is something I'd like you to think about as you go forward. Uh, and then towards the end of our selection here this week, they're going to be talking about how the political process in California has become dysfunctional. Uh, we talk about things like the influence of power, the increase in lobbyists, um, distrust in the legislature and maybe the governor too to get anything done uh, and maybe the saddest of all is that the domination of the initiative process by special interests and millionaires so I'd like you to think about that uh, and then finally I'd like you to think about why young people generally are not voting as much in California elections alright that's going to do it for this week if you have any questions please be in touch